Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and kick off the first uh, 2022 NOAA Hurricane webinar series. So welcome. If you've attended our series in the past, welcome back. And if this is your very first one, we're so glad that you're here with us today. I'm Meredith Cameron, National Coordinator for NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network. Today's webinar is sponsored by NOAA's National Hurricane Center and the Southeast and Caribbean Regional Collaboration Team, which we call CCART, which is one of NOAA's eight regional teams. This webinar will be recorded and available on the CCART and National Hurricane Center websites. And for this webinar, all participants have been muted. If you have a question, please type it in the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel in the upper right. Today's webinar is a really special one, and I'm so excited to be here with you. It includes live presentations, first from NOAA Hurricane Awareness Tour, where you'll meet staff and see our aircraft, and then from the National Hurricane Center down in Florida. Because of this format, we're not going to have slides. This is pretty much all live video. Um, and we encourage you to maximize the speaker window of your go-to webinar pane. So these slides that you're seeing right now will come down. And depending upon how you're accessing this webinar, this can be done by clicking the people icon, which is located at the top of that go-to control box and selecting the speaker window, or by clicking and sliding the bar that goes across the middle of the go-to window down to minimize. Hopefully you'll be able to, to have a good um, view of this really incredible webinar today. We're also, we're trying something new, so we hope you'll have some patience with us if there are any technical issues. And just one more reminder that any questions can go into that question box and we'll be able to, to see them and, and moderate them. Um, so before we get started, we are going to just remind folks about uh, that there are a couple other webinars coming up. Um, and we apologize if this screen is going to black, but we'll get it right. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so before we get started, I just want to alert you to two other webinars that are coming up soon. The first one's on May 10th, and you can scan that QR code up in the top corner, and that will take you to the website where you can register for either of these webinars or some other ones coming up in the future. So I think that is all the housekeeping that we have. I'm going to stop sharing my slide and Robbie and Dan, if you are out there, um, you guys can come on video and um, it's gonna be my pleasure to introduce you to Ken Graham, the director of NOAA's National Hurricane Center, who is standing out on the tarmac at Reagan National Airport in DC with some special guests. So over to you, Ken. Hi everyone. Listening today on the CCART webinar, this is Ken Graham, the director of the National Hurricane Center. We are in Washington, D.C. It's Hurricane Preparedness Week, and we're here at the Hurricane Awareness Tour, the first one since 2019. Just so excited to, to be here, and even more excited is who I'm with next to me here. I am. It's the administrator of NOAA, Dr. Rick Spinrad. What an honor to, to be able to talk to you today live, people across the country, and maybe even the world watching today, which is amazing. I wanted to ask, when I first walked into the hangar, the door over there, I saw the, the NOAA aircraft, I saw the aircraft, and I don't know, I, I felt a sense of just pride of the mission. I was, I was curious about your first impressions and, and, and how you felt today, just being on the, the NOAA team and talking to you. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, I, I like doing it the same sort of deal as well. It's kind of like the first time going to a baseball diamond in DC. It's gorgeous, spectacular setting. In this case, it was these four aircraft colleagues from Air Force as well. And your first impression is, wow, this is a big time, this is a big game, this is really serious activity. Uh, and then it just keeps getting better. As you walk on the aircraft, you get to see like, these particular aircraft bristling the state-of-the-art equipment that really is contributing to our ability to provide the forecast, to provide the guidance, the forecasters to help people make whatever decisions they need to make in their own lives and their industry. But, you know, the other part of this that I think struck me when I first walked in was the, the sea of blue and green. And by that, I mean our NOAA Corps officers, uh, who are the aviation community who fly, maintain, operate these aircraft, and our colleagues from the uh, Air Force as well. Uh, an extraordinary cadre of professionals who have the same passion you and I do for things meteorological, things for and are, of course, they're here for the hurricane awareness and they do all the work for the hurricane center and the other flights. But these aircraft are so much more for us. And, uh, so, knowing that these folks are the, 
make the cream of the crop that are provided in that big photo studio for us to do our mission. This is the other extraordinary thing of Pride Island. The, the same thing, right? Right when I walked through the door, it's exactly the same thing. Just a sense of pride about everyone being together and the whole team. I did want to ask, you know, part of our uh, news conference this morning, we had uh, Bebo from, uh, you know, just an administrator, the deputy administrator Bebo was here from FEMA. And, I, you know, I, I, you mentioned the comment about the whole partnership and the whole takes a team. And, you know, it just it was interesting to think about that. The whole team get a comment about, you can't do it alone. Just interesting how we all have to come together when it comes to hurricanes. Yeah, and I think our colleagues at FEMA represent that. Uh, they are obviously the experts in making decisions and advice on emergency management. Uh, and so working with them, knowing what their needs are. I remember a few years ago, in fact, in NOAA, we were talking about expanding the 24, 48, 72, 96 hour forecast. And our colleagues in FEMA and said, you know, once you get past about 96 hours, the mission changes for us at FEMA. So we have to rethink our objectives in NOAA. And, and I've also had to, yeah, FEMA and state of Washington are very lucky with partners on this. But there's still many other partners. I think the, the last question, thinking about this, you think about uh, how important are observations to work on If you think about looking at the globe, if you think about a uh, changing climate, you think about all this, how important is observations to what we do? Well, obviously, observations are the currency in the realm. Uh, we can't do what we need to do without uh, observations, but it's not just observations, it's critical, reliable, quality controlled observations that feed our models and provide for those forecasts. So you, you see a lot of our effort in the spent on making sure that our observations are good, accurate, accessible, archived appropriately, to be assimilated into models to work really well, and whether it's satellites and aircraft or ships or buoys or any of a number of different techniques. Always on the lookout for more, more accurate, more varied types of data that we can use through those observations to improve our products and services. Thanks all. Well. well, thank you, sir. Just appreciate you being out here and thank you, talking Ken. to us today. We just got such a great group. What an honor to be able to, to talk to Dr. Spinrad, uh, administrator of NOAA today. So, you know what we're going to do? Rob, you're going to follow me. We've got aircraft, we've got people to meet, we've got folks that are on these planes from NOAA and the Air Force. And we're going to be walking around meeting those folks. You ready? Here we go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have fun. All right, Robbie, here we go. So what an important thing this is to talk about hurricane preparedness, to talk about uh, being able to have the information to get ready for hurricane season 2022. And one of the big things is having the conversations to get ready. But the other part is meeting some folks behind the scenes. I mean, you think about the aircraft, we just saw the Gulf Stream 4 inside the hangar here in out. Out here, outside the hangar, here at DCA, DCA Airport, we've got the NOAA B3. We're going to meet some of the folks that are flying through the hurricanes um, during these big storms. And also the C-130 with the Air Force down here as well. So we're going to meet those folks as well. So these two planes fly into the hurricane. They go right into the hurricane to get the information that we need in the center, the pressure, the structure. Hey, think about this. We're trying to get everybody away from the hurricane. They're going towards the hurricane to get the information that, that we need. It's absolutely incredible. And the Gulf Stream 4 that we saw um, inside, that's high altitude. It doesn't go into the hurricane, but it helps us with the steering currents around the hurricane, looking at what's going to turn the hurricane. It's going to get stronger. What's going to turn to the north and maybe lose some of the the winds associated stall out. All that information is, is stuff that we're really interested in. And we get that from the aircraft. Data gets into the models, makes the models better. Just to meet some of these folks. So, Robbie, I think we're going to head on down here. I see Dan Brown. Rob, by the way, Robbie, uh, Robbie Burke, the hurricane specialist, he's holding the iPad here. And we've got Dennis Felkins right behind us. He's kind of the brains of the He runs his stuff. He tells us where to be, and we listen to Dennis. Hey, Dan and Robbie, this is Meredith. I just want to say you're breaking up a little bit, so if we could put that mic a little bit closer. That'd be great. How are you? How are you? Yeah, thanks for doing this. Yeah. So, again, we just want to kind of talk to you about what you do and on the plane and some of the role of the aircraft. So, this is awesome. Hi, my name is Meredith. I'm 
my name is Megan Gasson, and I'm a, um, a pilot on the P3. So when you're flying on the plane, I mean, you think about it, we get questions all the time, right? I mean, I know this is an obvious question, but all the kids that are watching, I don't know if the audience, they always ask, is it bumpy? What's a flight to fly a plane into a hurricane? Yeah, so it is uh, very turbulent, so it can be pretty bumpy depending on the storm. Um, so we just make sure we strap in as tight as possible and, um, you know, prepare for the worst. What's, what's some of the data that, that we get from the plane? That's another frequent question that we get. It's like, what, what kind of data that we get really flying into the, into the hurricane? What do we get out of it? Yeah, so uh, this plane in particular, the P3, flies through the eye wall of the plane. Um, so we do we that along. Drops on. That's the coolest. Yeah, that's the coolest. Yeah, that's that's the coolest. coolest. That's that's the coolest. coolest. <laughs> All right. 
We can do that. You can. So this is a drop saw or drop wind saw. All right. So, so basically, this is, this is stuck down in here. It's a little parachute. And basically, it goes in this tube in flight. And the pressurization from the airplane is what, when they open that hole down below, it shoots it out. And once it releases, the parachute comes out and it essentially goes into the, the airflow and it goes all the way down to the surface and it's sending back data the entire time that it is traveling down to the surface. That's incredible. What kind of data does it provide? Uh, so this this is air pressure. I mean, this pressure is pressure temperature, is pressure, temperature and pressure temperature, humidity and telemetry data. Humidity and Pro. telemetry data. Yeah. Okay. Wind speed and direction. Yeah. Wind speed and direction. There you go. It's incredible. All that information from that right there that that's dropped right out of the, the aircraft to yeah. get us that information. Okay. These look cool. Ah, so buoys, right? So these are uh, batho. Bathythermio what? Bathythermiographs. Bathythermiographs. So BTs we call them, right? So that's easier to remember. But basically, this is going to launch out, and it's not really doing so much in the air. But once it makes uh, contact with the water, it will start recording back. The salinity of the water actually powers a battery inside this buoy, and it will continue to report until we lose contact with it at a depth of shoot how deep, Matt? Uh, three hundred meters. Three hundred meters. Yeah. Pretty deep under the ocean. That's absolutely incredible. So really, uh, this is a uh, flying science lab. Really a good way to think about it, Robbie. If you pan over there, look at all the computer workstations. Uh, you have different uh, people, different professions working at each workstation, getting the data, uh, getting that data to us at the Hurricane Center and beyond, and the research missions as well. And think about all the research that takes place on this aircraft, the research to operations, and what that does is make the forecast better. It makes it really better. And that's what that's how important this mission is, not just operationally, but the research um, as well. So this is awesome. So we get to meet the folks on the, the NOAA P3 here. Um, anything else you want to add? What I forget? Anything cool? Uh, uh, you know, we, do, we do a lot more than on hurricanes. Too. Let's we talk about it. Yeah, what, what, to, uh, come on in, everybody. Where we go to PG Kansas, George Project. Uh, to collaborate with the NSSL, the National Severe Storms Laboratory. A lot of folks from OU will be there. There'll be some ground-based radars. Uh, exciting to see that we got some UAVs that are going to be collecting some data too. They'll be flying below the P3. We're flying these uh, supercells, producing uh, massive tornadic activity in the area. So it's kind of like uh, kind of like being a fireman, like on on report, waiting for waiting for something to happen, and then we all go into action. So it's a pretty exciting project to be headed out on pretty soon. Do we do that? Uh, Ocean Winter Winds Research. Uh, Grab D project where we're measuring the uh, gravitational fields out there and uh, all the other missions at AOC too that we do coastal mapping, further harbor seal tower projects. That's a neat place where really, really cool part of the economy. AOC, an aircraft operations center, Lakeland, Florida. That's where the headquartered uh, out of there. It's just an, an amazing place to see the planes together. So just just a big salute. Thank you for what you all do. Um, like I keep saying it over and over, I really do mean it. Just heroes going towards that storm so we can get people away from the storm. So just a big thank you to for what all you do. So you're seeing some heroes, everybody, across the country. We're on the P3. What are we doing next? Go talk to the, the Air Force. Want to do that? Okay. So we're live going down that ladder. Okay. And it's going to be fine. You know, it clearly is going to be fine. All right. Go backwards. It's easier. There you go. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> not just when the storms are strong, this is an important point. It's also during the genesis phase. When you look at the, the storm first starting. I think we'll go this way, Robbie. I think we'll be okay. This when the storm first starts. It, Watch your head. It's really not really sure um, where the center is and having the aircraft get out into that area to see. Areas of circulation uh, because a small change, a small change where the center is at the forming of stage, let's say 10 miles difference where that center is, it can make hundreds of miles difference in where the storm actually finally makes landfall. So it's significant to have that information uh, identified. We're going to walk over to the, uh, the Air Force, the Air Force Hurricane Hunters. You got Dan Brown here, guiding our way. We're checking the audio, everybody, real quick. Dan's listening in to see if we can hear us. Hear us. The perils of live broadcasting. So we're back. 
So the audio in and out works out perfect. You probably got to stick pretty close to the, the iPad. All right, who are we talking to, Dan? Got it. So the United States Air Force Reserve, he's the one third. Um, they are tasked with like, hurricane hunting as well. This is the aircraft, the C-130. It also like the D-3 for the to get that information. And we're going to talk to we're going to talk to somebody special right now. That's what we're going to do. He's waiting on us. We're going to talk about these two special people. Right? <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. Sir, how are you doing? So we've been covering things. We, we, when we talk about hurricane hunting, and we'll have you do this. This is a sea car. It's all sorts of the folks across, across Noah. It's all a lot of things out here. So oh, I'm really excited to do no pressure at all. So I think I was just talking to the iPad. Uh, so <laughs> sure. so tell us your, your name and uh, your position. What's going on there? I'm uh, Petty Colonel Jeremy Dehar. I'm an aerial reconnaissance weather officer in the Air Force. Sure. Okay. And uh, Major Kendall Dunn, uh, a pilot uh, on the WC 132. So just, just exciting to, to meet you both and introduce you to everybody. So yeah, we always get questions about what it's like to find Start off there. Why uh, are roller coasters a good way to describe it? Lots of up and down, side to side. Never sort of different, of course, but that's a good way to put it. Same thing? It's basically the same. Depends on when you're flying into it. So uh, when you're flying at night, it's a lot of lightning. It's like being in a rock concert. And if it's during the day and uh, precipitation is really bad, it looks like you're in a 200 mile an hour car wash. So it's just perfect. So think about, tell us about some of the data that you, you collect in our game. Well, uh, the airplane is collecting data uh, at flight level as we're flying through. So um, temperature, viewpoint, wind speed, pressure, all that stuff at the flight level with the aircraft. And then we also release what's called drops on from, from the airplane, which tells us the vertical extent of the atmosphere. So we're getting full swath of the storm every time we pass through. So one question we do get all the time, though, is the altitude, flight level. What is flight level? Uh, it depends on the storm. The strength of the storm for a, a typical hurricane mission is uh, 10,000 feet. So a lot of people think, well, you fly over the top and come down. 10,000 feet is right through the center of the storm. The feeling of going through the eye wall into the center of the storm, the stadium effect, getting into that eye, what do you like? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very surreal. Um, it's something that a lot of, not a lot of people get to see. Uh, basically, as you're approaching the storm, say, I'll go back to Irma. That's one of the first storms I really remember uh, feeling controls. So like, man, we're here. This is not good. The plane's not happy. Actually, I'm not happy. But uh, you just keep fighting through it, jockeying it, and trying to control the aircraft itself. But then you get right up to that point of eyeball. You know you're about to punch through because of the radar. And then, boom, you punch through and get kicked out. And uh, it's nice, clear air. You get this gorgeous stadium effect. And just not a lot of people get to see it. It's unbelievable. How do you choose how to get back out of that eye? Well, that's a good question. We rely on well, sometimes it's a team effort to choose the you know, maybe cleanest piece of air uh, to get through. Um, you, know, you all can see the, the, the rain that goes around sometimes. There's not a lot of good options, but um, pick the nice cleanest piece you can and just make it the primary text. So, so, so cool. Okay. Besides the car, besides, besides yourselves. Okay. Yeah, so we're on board the C-130, so we're going to look around here a little bit. Yeah, so this is just a standard uh, WC-130, excuse me, a C-130J, and we put the W on it. Um, we've put our weather equipment, so uh, it looks like a normal Army aircraft. And then we have the weather channel up front, too, doing some briefing stuff. Um, standard stuff, that's, that's our... Restroom that the man's leaning on right there, but anyway, that's a toilet for us. Number one question we always Yeah, have. it's like where do you use the restroom? Well, there it is. Uh, as you move forward, you'll see where the arm rolls are. Yeah. Yeah. You can actually go to the reverse and get the cockpit. What do you think, Robin? Are going to try to get in the cockpit? That's what we're going to do. We'll go backwards. Yep, we're going to go backwards yeah. into the cockpit. So it's just incredible. I mean, if you think about this, this aircraft flying into the hurricane and I, you know, I, I mentioned it several times. We'll just, we just really appreciate you all. We're gonna go this way. Wow! I really appreciate you all. Here we are. So, I guess real, real quick, one question. Do you get this? Why is it in the jet? I've seen this question. Yep. Um, C130 
Heat 130 propeller, first thing, it, it can break up a lot of the precipitation as you're flying through the storm. So if you don't get that all that coming into it, the jet can take it like you would. And we can fly C 130s really slow. So we don't, about half the speed of a jet would be. So we don't feel as much of the turbulence, which is what we're trying to do. Not feel as much of that. Perfect. So we're going to go in there, Bobby. We're going to pick up the flying deck. Okay. So, to get out of the shot, sit down right here. All right, so here we are. So, I, I guess one question that, that immediately comes to mind because I've heard it asked before how many people are up there? How many people does it take to fly this, this plane? So, basically, you have the two pilots up here uh, left and right seat, pilot, co pilot. Uh, right here, where Mr. Ken's sitting, is where our navigator sits, and that's a men crew. So, we fly the plane, navigate, get through the storm. Weather officer's in the back, and he's talking to us. Um, helping us get to where he wants to go. The pilots, basically the bus drivers, trying to get us there safe. And the navigator in the storm environment is just trying to keep us out of like uh, mesocyclones and those kind of things. So, so the, the navigator is looking at that. What what role? I know the meteorologist will play a role in collecting the data for us. What role does the meteorologist play in getting information up here as well? Uh, that, right. That's exactly. Sometimes you're dual hatted. I mean, you, you're not, uh, you're kind of put in that situation where I guess I'm the weather expert up here. So we need to find, talk about um, clearer path out. We don't want to fly through any hook echoes or any of that kind of stuff that you know could be an extra bit of circulation, like a tornadic signature flying through the eye wall. Um, and then, uh, yeah, once we're up here, though, we're, our job is primarily the mission director. As Kendall said, we're kind of telling the pilots where to go. To fix the exact location of the storm. So I guess trying to my next question, and we're going to probably turn it go to the, the hurricane center after this to get a tour of the hurricane center. So the last question is this: is uh, you know how long have you wanted to do this? And what makes you proud? Yeah. So uh, you know, college student, the only two things I wanted to do in life was coach and teach or be a pilot. So the pilot thing worked out. Joined the army first, then became air. Um, <laughs> whatever that was. Um, Anyway, so fortunately, I was able to do this. The Hurricane Hunters being close to Biloxi in that area. Um, the coolest thing about this mission, I've done a lot of uh, military missions, the Army and otherwise. This is an immediate impact mission. There's nothing cooler than landing and see it on, whether CNN, Fox News, Weather Channel. Like Hurricane Hunters just landed. They gave us this data. This is what they're seeing, intensifying. You got Mr. Ken on the Weather Channel saying, hey, Hurricane Hunters just came out. This is what they see. Y'all need to leave. You know, it's or stay, vice versa. Yeah. So it's a uh, very rewarding. So same question: uh, How long have you wanted to do this? Why do you do this? And uh, what makes you proud? Uh, a lot of the same answer. Kendall just had, you know, except for he wanted to grow up being a pilot. I was a weather nerd from the very get go. Um, watching the Weather Channel growing up as a kid. So I always knew it's something I wanted to do. Um, I spent 12 years in the active duty side of the Air Force doing more traditional kind of weather support for airfields, that sort of thing. Um, but nothing compares to the operational type impact that you get here doing this job as a, as a weather guy. It's the most exciting job in the world. And um, like Kendall said, to be able to see the impact of what we do in real time, we're, you know, we're getting this data, we're sending it to you all at the National Hurricane Center and within minutes, you guys are ingesting it into your forecast process and sending it out to the world for everyone out there to see. It doesn't get uh, more exciting. Well, we got pilots, we've got uh, meteorologists, we, we talk about different professions. The oceanographers there. Uh, we got a loadmaster too, right? We got loadmasters yeah, to make master. sure things are loaded correctly on the plane. So all these different different professions that we've heard. So um, all the folks listening out there, uh, the young folks, we, we need you, right? We need to recruit yes, lots of lots of new folks to to become get in the Air Force and get in these planes and help us out, get into the weather forecast offices and the national centers uh, across the the Weather Service and all across NOAA. So right now we are going to go to the National Hurricane Center in Miami. John, can you hear me? Yeah, Ken, I can hear yeah, you. Can you guys hear me? Thank you. All right. Can I just get confirmation that you guys can hear me okay? I can hear you fine, John. All right, great. Well, welcome to the National Hurricane Center, everybody. Again, my name is John Cangelosi. I'm one of the senior hurricane specialists here at NHC. 
And I really want to just give you a little quick virtual tour of how everything works at the Hurricane Center and really how our mission is connected to the hurricane hunters. So where I'm sitting right now is really called the heart of the National Hurricane Center. This is the location where we put out the hurricane advisories, the associated watches and warnings, and really work out all of the hazards and impacts as well. And I wanna start out this tour, I'll see if you can see the board behind me. This is sort of our big new video wall. And the reason I'm showing it to you, not only because it looks cool, but also because I wanna reiterate the very large area that the National Hurricane Center covers. We are by no means US centric. We cover a really large area, the entire Atlantic Basin from the west coast of Africa and Europe, all the way west across the Atlantic Basin, including the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea, and then into the Pacific Ocean as well to about two thirds of the way to Hawaii. And the tracks you see up there are from last year, but we'll be adding ones, unfortunately, in the 2022 season. Now, I wanna give you a little sense of how the forecast process works and how we work with the hurricane hunters as well. Now, we have 10 hurricane specialists here at the center that work 24 seven during hurricane season. And it can be very busy during the hurricane season, especially because we cover such a large area. Now, each forecast process takes about three hours to conduct. And in that three hours, we have to do the following. We have to figure out what's happening right now with the storm, work out what's gonna happen in the future, and then message that forecast. So that's really our job in the three hour period. So let me introduce you to some of the tools. I'll push this a little bit closer. Now, for the first step, we have to figure out the analysis. Now, when we call the analysis, we're talking about using current data to answer three questions. And here are those three questions. First, where exactly is the center of the circulation? Second, how strong is the storm? And third, how big is the storm? And I'll step out of the way just so you can get a sense of what the forecaster is going to look at. We're gonna analyze all sorts of data to make that conclusion. So that could be satellite imagery like you see here on these screens. That could be radar imagery, surface observations, and of course the all important hurricane hunter observations. Now when the hurricane hunters are flying, whether the Air Force that you just saw or NOAA, they're collecting that data and we can see it in just mere seconds to minutes of lag. In fact, just across the hall behind me, there's a small unit that is helping to facilitate and coordinate those missions. And they're also helping us interpret the data so we can quality control it and make it very representative of what's happening right now with the storm. All right, so that sort of controls the analysis, what's happening now. But if we have to look forward to the future, what do we use? We can't use data, so we switch gears and look at models that help us understand what's gonna happen in the future. And we use all different types of models, but I wanna show you how much progress we've made over the years. Now, the first element of prediction that we make is the track. Where is the system going? And I know it's probably hard to see, I'll turn the screen here, but in 1990, our average error, if we were making a landfall position near Biloxi, Mississippi, looked like that blue circle. So it was a really large area. But today, our average error is now that red circle for the same exact forecast scenario showing you how much progress we've made. And that's really all credit to the advancements in technology, in particular, the global models and advancements in science and understanding as well. And when it comes to predicting the strength, we've made progress here too. It's a little hard to see in your screen. I'm gonna skip that because it's just too blurry. But know that we've made a lot of progress with our intensity predictions as well, especially over the last 10 or 15 years. All right, so let's imagine for a second that we've figured out all the meteorology. We think we know where the storm is going, how strong it's going to be, how large it's going to be, our job isn't done there. Our next focus is to coordinate that forecast. And when we coordinate that forecast, it really depends upon where the storm is going and who we need to coordinate with. For example, if that storm is gonna bear down on the United States, well, then we go to a designated hurricane hotline where we could talk to the local National Weather Service forecast offices and the Department of Defense to iron out what the impacts are gonna be and where to place the watches and warnings. If the system is headed internationally, let's say it's headed to the Caribbean or Bermuda or Canada or Mexico, then we would call up the appropriate countries of impact. And although we don't issue watches and warnings for those countries, we work with their meteorological services to help coordinate those watches and warnings. So that's how the coordination works. After that, we then start our level of messaging and communicating. Now, the first level of messaging is to compose our products. So hopefully, those of you listening today have actually gone on our website, 
and gone past the forecast cone and maybe actually clicked on the forecast discussion tab because that tab is actually someone like me or Robbie or Dan or others that you're gonna hear from that will actually take time to compose a message about our levels of confidence for the prediction and the different data and models we're using to make that prediction. The forecast goes out three hours after we begin and from there, we switch gears to communicating. I'm actually gonna turn my screen around and I want you to see something. And I know you just spoke to Ken, and normally, if you look at the Hurricane Center, you're going to see it, Ken, at the desk just behind me. Because in that room, that's all glass, and you can see it in the distance. That's called our media room, where the media will actually be shooting cameras in the direction of Ken or any other person speaking. And then we'll have an opportunity to deliver the message about what this hurricane can do for different regions and also our level of confidence. And in addition to messaging it for the media, just behind, down the hall, we have another dedicated room that's FEMA run. And we have a couple of meteorologists there that we work with after the forecast goes out to actually talk to emergency managers about planning and also about evacuation decisions and the very complicated jobs that they all have. So in a nutshell, this is the forecast process. Of course, I boiled it down to five minutes, but I will tell you, this is a very dynamic, very stimulating place to work. Of course, it comes with some stress, but all of us here are very focused on the mission of saving life and property. So guys, I'm gonna pass it back to you. And if there's any comments or questions, I'd be happy to get them. And everybody, please stay safe this hurricane season. Hey, thanks, John. So we're back in the hangar now. Um, and I guess I'll pass it back to either Meredith or anybody else who's running to see if we have any questions um, from the audience. Yeah. Absolutely, Robbie. Um, we do have some questions. We have some, a lot of questions about um, the hurricane hunters, as you can imagine. Um, some of them, uh, we had a little bit of some audio issues, Robbie, just, just to let you know. So I think some people really want to just hear and maybe someone talk a little bit more about what it's like to fly into a hurricane. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't, <laughs> funny thing is, as a forecaster, I don't personally fly into hurricanes. So when we have a hurricane, uh, you know, people like me and Dan and, and John, we're back at the hurricane center looking at the data as it comes in and making the forecast. So we don't specifically fly in the planes ourselves. But, you know, from what I hear is that the, the flights can actually vary depending on the type of storm. What's really surprising is that for some of the strongest storms, say category fours and fives, uh, when the plane flies into them, it can actually be pretty smooth. And so it's kind of a contradiction. You think, why, if a storm is so strong, why would it be a smooth flight? Well, when a storm gets that strong, most of the time it gets very, what we call stable. And the winds are all circulating at the same speed and the same height. And it just it tends to be a smoother flight. But for some of the stronger, or sorry, the storms that are strengthening, when they start like a tropical storm, they get up to category one and two. If they're strengthening, this causes a lot of turbulence in the storm itself. And so in those flights, from what the hurricane hunters tell us is that when the planes fly into those storms, it can be a pretty bumpy flight. Uh, so it's probably a little bit counter to what many people thought when you think about Hurricane Hunter aircraft flying into these storms. Absolutely, totally different than what I would imagine. Um, here's another question. Is the data from the Hurricane Hunters publicly available? Very good question, yes. So um, the, the, the data that the Hurricane Hunters, both the NOAA and the uh, Air Force planes put out when they're flying through the storms is publicly available. Now, I will tell you that it's not the easiest data to understand and read when you're looking at it. It comes in very, what we call alphanumeric text, where it's a bunch of numbers and letters. And so it really takes somebody who's used the data a lot to understand what it's saying. And there's a lot of information in that data. It's where the plane is located, how strong are the winds, what's the temperature, uh, the pressure, all of those are pieces of data that we use as forecasters to determine how strong is the storm uh, and that helps us to make our predictions. So uh, to answer the question, yes, it is publicly available. It's just very hard to understand uh, for non-meteorologists because it's kind of in that garbled alphanumeric uh, format. Wonderful. Um, we have another one about if the National Hurricane Center has an evacuation plan, since it's in Miami, which is you know a, a often a hurricane prone area. Right. That's an excellent question. You know, we have a great partnership with our 
uh, co-workers at the Aircraft Operations Center. I think you probably heard Ken Graham say that they're located in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, that's kind of in the middle of the state between Tampa and Orlando. And the great thing about their location is that they're not in a surge zone. Uh, so even though they could be prone to hurricanes themselves being in Florida, they're not in a surge zone. So if we are threatened in Miami, uh, we can make the easy three-hour drive north and kind of set up a remote operations, in, in essence, uh, at their location in Lakeland. So uh, we do have that in our, on our books if we ever had to use it. You know, hopefully we don't. Uh, I will say that the Hurricane Center itself is a pretty strong, sturdy building. It's, it's made of concrete with multiple layers. And so we've stayed in the Hurricane Center for other past storms, like Hurricane Irma in 2017. I actually slept on the hard floor uh, one of those nights during Irma uh, because I had to work some forecast shifts and then uh, still the next day and we couldn't leave the center. So, uh, you know, we, we try to stay if we can, if it's not going to be too bad, uh, but we can also send some people up to Lakeland to take over our operations and make sure the forecast still gets out if we were ever to lose power uh, or communications at the hurricane center itself. Wonderful. And I know that you showed us different types of aircraft, but we have a question here about um, do do the hurricane hunters only fly into a hurricane or do they do tropical storms as well? What is sort of that? What is Good that question. They kind of do? Yep. I was going to say, is, is John still on? I want to see if we want to pass anything back to him, have him answer it. John, are you still I, am there? Here. I am here, Robbie. Yeah. Do, do you want to take that one? Oh, yeah, no problem. Sure. So yeah, so I think the question was, do the hurricane hunters fly in other storms like tropical storms? And yeah, they do. So the hurricane hunters are doing a great mission for, for us as meteorologists and also for the for the general public. Uh, they'll fly in systems that are could be very weak. We're, we're talking like a, just a tropical disturbance up through a category five hurricane. The general idea for the hurricane hunters is anytime the system is going to be a threat to land, regardless of its intensity, especially the US, but even internationally, they will target it because remember, it could be weak now, but it might be something more substantial in the future. So they're gathering data to help the meteorologists, which are again, helping us significantly both with that analysis and also the forecast. Wonderful. And John, maybe you can answer this one too. A couple questions about um, whether or not the outlook for the 2022 hurricane year has been released. And if so, what does that look like? John Freeze. Okay, so I think John froze. So I think the question was about the uh, the hurricane outlook. Um, you know, NOAA doesn't put out its forecast until later this month, uh, about mid to late May. Um, I think what we can tell you is a few things. One is that we're still seeing a La Nina happening in the Pacific Ocean, and a La Nina is when some of the waters in the Eastern Pacific uh, tend to be warmer than normal, and that actually helps foster hurricane activity in the Atlantic. So when we see this pattern, we tend to see more hurricanes, more tropical storms. So while we don't have exact numbers yet, because the forecast has not been issued, I wouldn't be surprised if we end up having, again, an active season. But like we like to say, it only takes one. It can be a slow season. And if that one storm that we have hits your location, uh, it's not a it's a busy season for you and it's not a good season for you. So we always tell people, prepare, 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 regardless of what the forecast is because you just never know what kind of storm or where it might hit, when it might hit. Absolutely. Um, we've got a couple more questions, but one that I'd like to go to is, um, we have a couple of folks asking about what type of college degree did either of you two go for and, and what might be some advice to Do you want to take that one first, John? Uh, sure, Robbie. Uh, I think my audio is back. So. Yeah, yeah, so college, okay. college degree is um, generally almost all of us have a degree in meteorology. Um, well, sometimes that comes with a package deal of, of math and physics, a lot of math and physics classes. But uh, yeah, if you'd like, to, if you're interested in this career, uh, pursuing a degree in meteorology is certainly the way to go. Most people who work at the Hurricane Center have higher level education, like a master's degree, and some even have a PhD. But getting started in the weather service certainly. A bachelor's in meteorology will get you started and a focus on something else, either if it's a focus on communication or a focus on computer science is usually an additional help. Yeah, I agree with John wholeheartedly. I was gonna add, you know, I also got a meteorology degree um, and I double majored too. When I was an undergrad, I got marine science or oceanography degree too. So, you know, oceans and hurricanes kind of go hand in hand. Hurricanes don't survive without the ocean. So 
uh, that has really helped me. And then I went on and got a master's degree in communications. So just like John said, sometimes even going into other subjects helps in the field of meteorology. Uh, we make the forecast, but we also have to know how to communicate the forecast. So having those degrees uh, definitely does help. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think we have some time for some more questions, so we'll we'll keep going. But but John and Robbie, let, let me know how we're doing on time. Yeah, I was going to say, do you mind if I take it back real quick? Sure, absolutely. I had a Go few other people I was going to introduce you guys to. See if I can swing the webcam around. There we go. So first off, first off, we got one of our uh, Hurricane Center employees here, Cody. Dr. Cody Fritz is the head of the storm surge unit at the Hurricane Center. So Cody, you know, what is storm surge? Because I think when we think about hurricanes, we think what? Wind? We think about what wind. Think, yeah. but, uh, generally, storm surge can just be defined as that annual rise in water levels um, due in part mostly to a tropical cyclone, like a tropical storm or hurricane. Yeah, so historically, we know that storm surge can be one of the biggest you know, killers from a hurricane. Um, and I think we've seen some recent maybe trends in the past few years of that maybe changing course. Yeah, one could argue um, 2017 really going to like mitigate storm surge um, deaths as it relates to hurricanes. <laughs> um, and then you know, like the last few years, we've kind of mitigated that. Your new strategies on how we communicate one first Great, yeah. So you know, we know water is is really a big deal. It's not just about the wind. And uh, one of the statistics we often talk about is that of people that die in tropical cyclones, nine out of those ten deaths tends to be from water, and that includes the storm surge, like Cody just talked about, and then it also includes water from the sky, heavy rainfall and flooding. So now we also have here is a director of the Weather Prediction Center in Washington, D.C., uh, Dave Novak. So Dave, yeah, tell us about rain. Why is rain in a hurricane, why is it such a big deal? You know, what, what are we concerned about in those cases? It's amazing, right? You wouldn't think rain can kill, but as we saw with uh, Ida and uh, Ida Northeast, you get enough uh, you know, rainfall rates, two to three inches an hour over concrete, you, know, you can have these uh, devastating runoff events, flash flooding, and other impacts. So, uh, in fact, I think the last five years, thirds of the of the deaths, especially with hurricanes, have been associated with just rainfall. They're associated uh, impacts. So, one of the key phrases we like to say uh, is "Turn around, don't drown when you uh, when you reach uh, a flooded roadway." So many unnecessary deaths occur when folks are driving through flooded flooded roads. So you come. Your family or just yourself you're driving you come across the flooded roadway turn around don't drown it's, it's, it, it really can save your life great thanks so much dave yeah so i mean we just want people to understand that water is really a major issue when it comes to hurricanes and it doesn't have to be a major hurricane to dump a lot of water and cause a lot of flooding so it's really a big concern so uh thanks dave uh, you know we wanted to introduce you to a few of the others uh, that we work with at the hurricane center and uh I think I'm covering the camera now. Um, <laughs> sorry, at the Hurricane Center and some of our other uh, sister offices within the Weather Service. Uh, so, looks like we got about 10 more minutes, Meredith. I guess if there's any other questions, we can uh, take some more. Sure, absolutely. Let's take a look at some of these questions. Um, well, I guess this is for you or John, if we we still have him. But can hurricanes produce tsunami? John, are you still there? Um, yeah, I am. Would you like me to take this one? Sure, go ahead and take that. Oh, sure. So yeah, uh, I, I know why that question comes up because often you think like a tsunami sort of looks like storm surge, but no, hurricanes and tsunamis are not really related at all. Um, so hurricanes, remember these atmospheric phenomena, they're producing hazards that we've been talking about like wind and surge and rain. Now you might confuse a tsunami for a significant storm surge because it kind of looks like it. I mean, you get a, a huge waves and a push of water, but tsunamis are caused by earthquakes, um, not by hurricanes. Thank you, John. Um, John, maybe one more for you. We had a couple questions about where hurricane hunters fly. So you talked maybe a little bit about 
not necessarily just storms that are going to impact the U.S. People are asking, do you also fly? Do they also fly storms that are going to hit other parts of of um, the world as well as do they go? You know, are they pretty much just in the southeast, or do they fly up to Maine and New York? Where where do these hurricaneers hurricane hunters go? Oh, that's an awesome question. In fact, I think I'm going to take you to the board to give you a little demonstration about where they generally go. So. So, all right, so they obviously, you know, remember where the hurricane hunters are based out of. So they're based out of, and you'll learn this, Biloxi, Mississippi, Lakeland, Florida, and they do have an additional location down in the Caribbean, see if I can pan it, out here to St. Croix, which is near Puerto Rico. Now, the hurricane hunters can't get everywhere on this map for fuel considerations and other purposes, but their general box is to cover west of about 52 degrees west longitude which if I kind of zoom in here and try to keep it steady, it's pretty close to the Eastern Caribbean islands. So generally from where my hand is, off to the west, hurricane hunters can get in the Atlantic Basin. They'll also fly into the East Pacific though. If we do have a storm headed toward Mexico, especially a strong storm, or they rarely get up toward California, but if they would, hurricane hunters can get out there as well and out off the map toward Hawaii. So they'll target any areas that they can reach, especially if they have a base somewhere nearby, to actually get there with enough fuel. Wonderful. And John, since you're still with us, maybe you can help um, answer this question. Can you please explain how the glider data is incorporated into the forecasting model? So each model, ha each model handles this a little bit differently. So what's happening is the models generally have this scheme called data sillimation. So they're taking the current data, whether it's satellite data, surface observations, those weather balloons that go up, or the hurricane hunter data or the drop signs that go down and the collection of that data. And then it gets put on a grid and interpreted in the models to try to get the correct base state. Now think about it this way. You might say, well, how does that help the models, right? I mean, all right, they're just getting data that's not looking forward. But the reality is if we can get the models with the best current conditions and what is better than a current condition from the hurricane hunters, for hurricanes. If we can get them to the closest correctness, then we could probably get a better prediction out of them. So that's the beauty of the hurricane hunter data. It's, it's a double benefit. It's helping the hurricane uh, center figure out what's happening. And then it's also helping us and the models predict what's going forward by giving the models the best initial state. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay, one one last question I think here. Are there any new tools that the National Hurricane Center will be using for this year's forecast in particular? Okay, would you like that one, Robbie? Sure, I mean, I can take that. So, you know, tool-wise, um, I don't think there's anything really huge and major. I mean, I'll, I'll mention that you saw all the planes, you know, that we toured and some of the things that we didn't talk about is, for example, on the bottom of both the C-130 and the P-3 is an instrument called the SFMR. And you're probably saying, well, SFMR, what does that acronym stand for? It's the Stepped Frequency Microwave Radiometer. And what that instrument is actually doing is it scans down at the ocean surface, and it's actually looking at the sea foam that's created by the strong winds from the hurricane. And based on the amount of foam that's on the sea surface, uh, it then gives an estimate of how strong the winds actually are. So. You know, that tool has been very instrumental over the past couple of years in helping us understand better how strong these storms are. And that's a particular tool where every year we're getting a little bit better and better with those estimates uh, and getting a much better understanding of how strong the storms are. Um, you know, we already talked a little bit about the gliders. Uh, there's some efforts and research underway with the drones, uh, sending drones into hurricanes. Uh, it's not something we're using, I say, in an operational sense quite yet, but, you know, there's a lot of promise there that maybe we, these drones can reach hurricanes that are well too far away for the aircraft to reach, uh, but that we could actually get observations in the hurricane itself, even if it's way out over the ocean. Thank you, Robbie. Um, well, I think we're we're ending towards, where we're coming to the end of, of the webinar. Robbie, John, were there any last words or anything else you wanted to show us before we wrap up? Robbie, I think we lost audio for you. I'm sorry about that. I turned it off. I meant to keep it on. <laughs> so one thing that we wanted to mention is that if you're not aware, you know, this is National Hurricane Preparedness Week. Uh, started on Sunday. This is now day three. Uh, and every day this week, we have different themes that we're asking people to, you know, think about uh, as it comes 
before hurricane season because now is the time to prepare. You know, you don't want to be rushing when there's a hurricane trying to get supplies and things like that. So, you know, for example, and I'm looking at the, the lineup here on this other iPad, but uh, Sunday was determine your risk. You know, are you at risk of hurricanes? Are you in an evacuation zone? That's something you need to know. Uh, if you are, then you should develop an evacuation plan. Uh, today's theme is assemble disaster supplies. And I, I always tell people this is that now in May, when I go to the grocery store, I pick up a few extra items so that again, if a hurricane's threatening, I don't have to worry about it then. I've already got things stocked up in my shelves. Uh, the rest of the week, just to go quickly, is you know get an insurance checkup. Make sure that you and your family uh, have the insurance you need in case there was a disaster. Strengthen your home. Your home needs to be sturdy. Help your neighbor. That's always important. You can't get through this alone. You need your community. Uh, and then last but not least, probably the most important is to complete a written plan. Having it written down on paper helps you know what to do when it gets a little chaotic, when the stress levels go up, uh, and you're ready to go You know when there's a hurricane threatening. So uh, if you need it, any help remembering any of those, go to our website, www.hurricanes.gov, uh, and you can find all the information you need on how you should be preparing for this upcoming hurricane season. Thank you, Robbie. John, any last words from you? Last thing I'll say is just to kind of piggyback on Robbie is that, you know, I know we often go through this, this period of time where our area doesn't get hit by a hurricane. But I want everybody to take every hurricane seriously and just follow what Robbie said. Follow this work. Take the time this week and you'll take that stress away and you'll be ready for hurricane season. I don't think hurricanes are that scary, honestly, because we can take the steps to get ready well ahead of time. So if you do that, you can take the stress away and focus on what's important, protecting yourself, your home, and your family. That's really all that matters. Wonderful. Thank you both. Give me so one last look at the G4 before we leave. <laughs> there she is. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm just going to go ahead and, and close us out here. I just want to thank all of our speakers um, and all of the attendees that attended today. We know that we had some audio and video issues going on there for a little bit. Um, we have this recorded webinar, so we'll work to ensure that there's no options um, for any of the audio that folks may have missed. But we're, we're so thrilled that you joined us today. Um, and we wish Noah and you guys are luck in this season um, and again if you are interested in any of our other webinars they are available on the ccart and the national hurricane center web pages um, the next one is may 10th and we'll discuss tracking hurricane ida through noaa's office of response and restoration so you should be able to register for that if, if you're interested um, but otherwise i just want to say thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day